Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Sabbath Rest Book Talk for November of 2017. Uh, our topic this evening is holidays, which I think has an undercurrent of expectations. So it's almost like that is our theme for the evening, our focus, our, our humanity aspect that we want to look at tonight is how fiction shows us what it means to be human and have expectations. My name is Erin McCole Cup. I am author of the Jane E. Friendless Orphan Memoir series, uh, an ebook dealer near you. I'd also like to introduce my co-hostesses with the co-mostesses for the evening. We have Carolyn Astfalk. Carolyn, why don't you go ahead and say hi to, to our folks out there? Yes, welcome. I'm Carolyn Asfalk from Hershey, PA, and I'm the author of several inspirational romances. Yes, the most recent of which is an inspirational romance for teens called Rightfully Ours. And Carolyn actually has a little announcement for those of you at the end of the program, um, for those of you with teen readers or those of you who are teen readers. So we've got some goodies coming for you on that. Our other co-hostess is Rebecca Willen. Uh, she of the red pen. She's an editor. <laughs> Virtual red pen. Rebecca, go ahead and introduce yourself. <laughs> Say hi to our viewers. Hello, I'm Rebecca Willen coming to you from Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, and I actually am picking up the black pen again. I've been asked to ghostwrite a book for the religious order that I work for. So I'm digging out the moral theology. And so you'll hear, hopefully hear updates about that at some point. But we'll writer and editor. That's pretty exciting. So, like, if you're ghostwriting, do you have to, like, put a sheet around or, like, write <laughs> chains or anything? At this point, I think it just means that I'm disembodied because, I tell you, I don't think the brain's connecting all the way some days. Okay, well, you're fulfilling part of the ghost, the, the ghost <laughs> aspect of the writing. And as long as you get the writing done, too, then I, I imagine you're good to go. That's exciting. I, I ghostwriting, that's pretty thrilling. Well, speaking of ghosts, or I guess things from the past. <laughs> You're dead people. <laughs> Let's talk about our featured fiction for this this month. Um, to talk about, I'm sorry, to show all the interesting things we can examine, experience as part of that human phenomenon called holidays. We are pretty confident that squirrels don't have holidays. We can be pretty confident that protests holidays. Holidays are something that I think are an aspect of what makes us human. We have things that we look forward to. We have, and not in the way that like my dog looks forward to when I say oi when I'm cooking in the kitchen. Because my dogs are, have actually been trained that if I say oi, that means that I dropped something, so it's time for them to come running. That's their level of expectation. Humans have much more complex expectations, and that's what we're going to talk about here, um, how those expectations and some other themes that might tie into the idea of holidays and how humans, we, we have these holidays, whether you're Christian or anything else, you, you've generally got some sort of, even if you're atheist, you're probably going to, in America, you're going to celebrate whatever civic holidays we've got. So that's, having a holiday is part of being human. Oh, goodness, I almost forgot. Wow. Um, okay, so Leslie Lynch, friend of Sabbath Rest Book Talk, Sabbath Rest Book Talkers, one of our favorite indie authors, one of the books that we're talking about this Christmas Grace by Leslie Lynch. Leslie has been kind enough to put up a free audiobook for Sabbath Rest Book Talk watchers. All you have to do to be entered to win a copy of Christmas Grace audiobook is comment on the video as we're watching. At the end of Sabbath Rest Book Talk this evening, we'll have a little random drawing. And if we've got Anybody commenting, <laughs> who knows, your chances might be really good. If you're the only person who comments before 7.30 p.m., guess what? You're going home with an audiobook of Christmas Grace. And um, Kleenex not included because you'll, you'll need them for this. So anyway, without further ado, let's, let's save talking about Christmas Grace for last. Let's start talking about our 
book for the evening, The Burr's Christmas Carol by Kate Douglas Wiggins. She wrote another book that I didn't. Carolyn. Wrote, um, oh, wait, no, what? Rebecca. Go ahead. She, did she write Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm? Um, I think she may have. The ones that I know her for best are What Katie Did and What Katie Did Next. Um, she may, I think she did write Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm. She's written a number of, of books for girls. But she's written a number of children's books. Okay, and this is one of them. And this is a rather slender, quick read. Um, as you can see, I got mine from the library. Carolyn, I think this one might have been your suggestion. What is that? Am I remembering no, it's, correctly? It's a Rebecca it's selection. Actually. It's a Rebecca I selection. Got okay, slimmer copy from my library. <laughs> oh, very nice. <laughs> um, this I is got it for free on Gutenberg.org. So. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> So, Rebecca, what made you think about The Bird's Christmas Carol as a selection? I mean, obviously it's about Christmas, duh, but what made you think of that book specifically? I read... When we went to talk about holidays. I read this one when I was a kid. Um, and I think one of those books that has stuck with me since I was young, because I remember getting a copy of it at some point, probably at a used book sale. Um, and it was... Like it was one of those books that stuck with me, and I've remembered it for all these years. So, and as far as books about Christmas, has that has I've just really remembered, and I think partially just because of the it's it's a very sweet reading it again, and it's it's sometimes a little too sweet, but <laughs> I liked it. So. so, yeah, what was that like? What were some things that you think you you noticed more about? Um, this about Birds of Christmas Carol when you were reading it as an adult that you might have missed when you were a kid? Um, unfortunately, as an adult, reading stories about perfect little children always kind of bugged me because I was never the perfect child. Um, that's probably the main thing I noticed. as Because as a kid, I just appreciated the, I guess, the cleanness of it, just how it's a very bright book. And it, it makes the, there's, it, but it's a very like it's a book that brings light I think as an adult reading it again I was still able to see that light um but be able to kind of step outside the book a little bit more and appreciate all of the other characters rather than as a kid I think I just really focused on Carol and on um, one of the Ruggles children and as an adult kind of seeing the whole family uh, yeah, the, scene, the whole family dynamic, I see what you're talking about. Yeah, I think since I'd only read this as an adult, I, what I really um, latched onto, I guess, was, I mean, it, it was it was more than foreshadowing of what was going to happen to Carol, the main, you know, young lady mm -hmm. character in the book at the end, that the whole, the, it's it was interesting, I think, like, the, the expectations of what a family dynamic would have been then, and yeah, it was pretty idealized. In it, it, the story, I guess to summarize, we've got um, a rich family that lives very close to a very poor family. And the rich family, they have a, a daughter born on Christmas Day. But unfortunately, she grows up, she's very, very sick. So, you know, Vic, Victorian times, when was this written? Um, I think it's actually like... kind of know. Is it later than that? Or so. I think it's actually early 1900s. Okay, so Ed Edwardian. Yeah. Okay, but all right, but anyway, Actually, like. Yeah. So is the what is, is this story is about is about all the expectations of you know what a Christmas should be, and the wealthy family through Carol, the sick daughter, wanting to share what they have for Christmas with the family of the Ruggleses that's not that well off. Um. And so they, they throw a little Christmas dinner for for the children who aren't aren't so well off but have health. Whereas Carol, the little girl of the family, she has wealth, but she doesn't have health, but she does have generosity. So I think that that so shows I, I like I think, I think like that what surprised not surprised me. Under at how different the family dynamic is in the bird family and even the ruggles family like there's 
there's love and care and exuberance and people make mistakes and are clumsy, but they still, you know, are, are kind to each other on the whole, which is a complete, completely different scene than when you see if you turn on a, like a teen show on Disney or something like that with brothers and sisters and they all hate each other and they're all constantly making fun of each other. All right. So I've talked a lot. Carolyn, what was your take on, um, how the human experience of holidays was shown through the Bird's Christmas Carol. Well, you know, again, as an adult, it is, it's, um, it's pretty simplistic and the girl is very saintly, which isn't a bad thing, but used to, as an adult, I'm used to reading really more flawed characters. Uh, but I read this aloud, mm -hmm. you know, my daughter, of course, caught in right from the beginning. She was worried about the sickly child, <laughs> Carol. Um, so there's not a big surprise with it. Um, but it's interesting, the expectations, when you talk about, you know, from the, the wealthy family, boy, the expectations seemed like they were much more uh, rigid, actually, coming from the Ruggles family. Mrs. Ruggles, like, had those kids primed in practice so that they could sit properly at the table and eat their fancy Christmas dinner with the rich folk next door. Um, and really, I think her expectations were much higher than, than Carol's family, who were just happy to welcome these kids into their home. It was interesting in that sense. Yeah, I saw that, too. How um that I, I, the, the generosity of the Bird's family was, it sort of almost like relaxed their expectations and made them more merciful. It's not like, I mean, you never got the sense that they were like inviting these less well-to-do kids over because out of a sense of pity even, it was just, oh, we have stuff to share. We want to share it with them. Whereas the Ruggles family, it was almost like they were, you know, at least the mom was more afraid of being judged at, or at least, you know, cautious about that, that possibility. And it sort of, you know, brought to mind for me that, you know, okay, so we've got these holidays and especially Christmas, there's, there could be so much outside, we're inside ourselves that we're not doing what's expected of us. And I, I guess I don't quite know where to go with that. I've never really thought of it that way until we were doing these, these read, I was doing these readings for this month. Um, yeah. That's one of the things I, think I, I like about the Bird's Christmas Carol is because the, what, what actually drives Carol is what would Christ expect of me on Christmas? Yeah, yeah, she, I saw that. One of her last sentences is, is, I think we've celebrated Christmas the way our Lord would. That's right. And that's what she wants to, you know, she wants to do with what the gifts that she has. And she doesn't, she's never the kid that's sitting there thinking, oh, I mean, can't go out and ride my new pony on Christmas Day because I can't get out of bed. No, she does what she can with what she has. And I think that's a really nice, a, 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 nice, I hate using that word. It's an excellent example of you with our struggles and pains even and I guess it's sad because I don't you don't see a lot of that sort of idealism in fiction anymore Carolyn did you want to add anything on the birds Christmas Carol um no but I think the expectations ties in nicely to unearthing Christmas <laughs> yeah God, tell us about uh can you give us a little rundown about what Unearthing Christmas is yeah, about? Because it is a wacky concept. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, I'll try to. Um, it's been a while since I read this one. But um, so in Unearthing Christmas, you have, again, two families, um, totally different expectations within a family of what Christmas should look like. And you're moving back and forth in time between um, a bunker in 1955 and um, I think it's 2015, but present day. Mm -hmm and to the 14 year old girls um so you have was it laurie and in, in 1955 who's um i guess she's not really seeing eye to eye with her mom they're not really getting along so great she wants to celebrate christmas down in the bunker um and that's where she actually sort of meets peggy from present day who with her friends has discovered the bunker and are going down there as well and so there's kind of an interesting um I don't know whether it's, I guess it's just, you'd call it a supernatural type of um, connection between the two girls that helps them understand better, um, not only about Christmas, but about um, right and wrong, about forgiveness, and about um, reconciling with one another. 
Yeah, I thought it was a, a really, it, it's a concept like I've never seen before. It's not exactly time travel. It's sort of like this, so this spiritual, spiritual cry of the soul of, ah, uh, not Peggy. What's the other character's name? Oh. Laurie. Laurie. Laurie? Yes, Laurie. Laurie. Yes, because her name is Laurie. Okay, Laurie. It's like the cry of the heart of this one. I can't really say much because I'll spoil things because Rebecca didn't get a chance to finish this one. Um, sorry to out you on that, Rebecca, but she, <laughs> I don't want to put you on this spot. Anyway. Um, My silence is going to be obvious at some point. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, I, it was really fascinating to see the interplay between these two characters. They both have this disconnect with their family. I think that Christmas, since there's so many expectations around what it's supposed to be like with our family, like our families are supposed to be perfect for Christmas. So, you know, no, nobody sees our, our broken pieces. And then this character who has grown old and left, Lori is now old by the time Peggy comes into the scene and has left almost like a shard of her spirit not literally but it's almost like this shard of her spirit was left behind in this underground bomb shelter at christmas years ago and peggy who's also has this disconnect with her family because she's i mean there's no other way to say it she's a juvenile delinquent yeah we went right from you know saintly carol bird who's who's you know going to to before she dies, she wants to do what, what Jesus would do for Christmas. And then we've got Peggy over here <laughs> and unearthing Christmas, who's like, you know, you know, she's been busted for drugs a few times. And they're, they're sort of, you know, going around trying to steal things. And, oh, wow, hey, check this out. There's this bomb shelter. <laughs> but it was such a fascinating thing to see how these two broken people from across decades could find each other and heal each other. So I, I really, I like that aspect of, of Unearthing Christmas, how it it's blew, when like we're talking about expectations, it blew so many expectations out of the water that the heroine was, ended up being the juvenile delinquent. Yeah. Yeah. Any it's, other? It's, a unique, it's just a unique story, a unique uh, setting. And, um, you know, Peggy's got some juvenile delinquent friends and they're all kind of caught up in it. And, and they all really receive some kind of measure of healing through it all too. They do. That's right. I think I was maybe so wrapped up in what was going on with Peggy and Lori to really notice that. But you're right. There, there's a little bit of healing that's sort of sprinkled through everybody. I think even Peggy's family in the end, yeah. if memory serves. Yep. All right. So Rebecca, any little thoughts from what you've been able to look at in on well, There's something actually, because, um, I was realizing just in the first chapter or so, the kind of the disconnect between the child's expectation of Christmas and the adult's expectation of Christmas. And it's kind of, I just think it's interesting how when you're dealing with the holidays, particularly Christmas, you have so many traditions, so many family expectations, so many like things that you think that the world wants from you and things that just inside the family, things that you want. I just, I find it interesting because it plays into all three of the books that we're, that we're dealing with, which is the difference between the externals and the internals of the holidays. That's right. And I think that's a really good lead into um, Christmas Grace by Leslie Lynch. Oh, by the way, before, I feel like we skipped that. Uh, Unearthing Christmas is another indie book, and it's by Anthea Piscaric. I think to she I know she she had a, a publisher thing that happened and she just recently found a new house for it so if you're looking to get it for Christmas for somebody um, go on Amazon or Google Anthea's name her name is in the comments or in the uh, description of this video so look down there and um, Google that and you should be able to get a copy um, but you can win your own audio copy of Christmas Grace by Leslie Lynch. Win for free. All you have to do is, let's see, I think it's going to be stage right. There should be a little window for comments over here. And if it's not here, then it's over here. 
it's somewhere on the sides of our faces. So what you've got to do is make sure you comment with, you know, hi, I, I want to win a copy of Christmas Grace by Leslie Lynch, and we we will hook you up. Um, yeah, your your chances are pretty good right now, statistically speaking. Anyway, um, this Leslie Lynch, Leslie Lynch, has she ever written anything that hasn't made us cry? Like big, ugly cry? <laughs> no, no, she hasn't, because that's what Leslie Lynch does. She makes you cry, but it's all the best tears. We're talking about, like Rebecca just talked about the the expectations, the internal versus the external. And wow, is there like a train wreck of all of those types of expectations <laughs> all coming together in this book and making your yes. heart break. Okay, yeah. so we've got, it's not just one generation of expectations. It's not two, it's three. Four if you count the baby. <laughs> There's a baby. In, in so we have, nobody wants to celebrate Christmas this year. That's how the, the little blurb on the back starts for Christmas Grace. Because we have Ella, whose husband is deployed. Ella is pregnant. And I'm sorry, that, that it's Natalie. Yep. I mixed yep. them up. Natalie. Yep. That's okay. <laughs> Natalie is the daughter of the family. And she's pregnant. Her husband's deployed. And she's just not feeling Christmas this year. The mom of the family, Ella, her, she and her husband have just not been getting along. And now she's got to set aside all of her personal and professional hopes and dreams that she's finally let herself feast on because, but now she's got to set them all aside. So her, for the sake of her husband's work. So she's kind of bitter about that. Not kind of. She's she's bitter. <laughs> she's bitter <laughs> on the outside and the inside. The inside is not filled with creamy nougat. <laughs> then we have Gertie. Oh my goodness, I loved Gertie. She was just so Gertie. Sweet. Gertie is my grandmother. <laughs> Gertie was my grandmother too. Bless, well, almost. Bless, she yeah. She my my granny. Bless, you know, may the the Lord um, perpetual light shine upon her. She. Um, yeah, she she was the widow who really you know miss, missed her man, and but she didn't take up with with a biker. Did your mom? Did your grandmother take up with a biker? <laughs> no, no, but no, but that like that spunk. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, yeah, that is my that what? Well, rest her soul, my grandmother is dead as well. But no, that just like will say whatever the heck she feels she needs to or wants to say to whoever is there. Yeah, that's that's my that was my grandmother. <laughs> Yeah, we, I have I, goals. I, I have goals of being my grandmother, slash Gertie. Yeah, slash Gertie. Are you going to take up with a biker? Anyway, Gertie <laughs> is recently widowed, and it's she's biking. really <laughs> why not? As long as he's a good Catholic biker. <laughs> anyway, exactly. Um, so Gertie, she lost her husband, and it's just like the details that Leslie gives us to show us the pain that Gertie is going through. Like, just that she's, you know, like, okay, I'm not going to smell his unclean shirts today. And it's just, oh, my God, this is just a knife in the heart, really. So there's just this, oh, oh my goodness. It's so good. Carolyn, I'm going to stop talking. Tell us, tell us some things about Christmas Grace by Leslie Lynch. Um, well, see, my memory's rusty because I read this a while ago and I was, uh, trying to remember what stuck with me about it and, and look back at it. And I think what struck me most is I loved the, the fact that it was that three generations because so much of what I read is centered on young people, whether it's teens or it's young adults. And, and very rarely do I really get to book to get inside somebody who's middle-aged or older. Um, and so I don't really fit into any of these categories of these three women. I'm somewhere between them, you know, and, and yet um, their, their pain is so universal and their frustrations with, you know, either their husbands or, you know, just life, whatever life is thrown at them, that you could see all their different expectations, you know, greatly different, but still just all adding up to this is a less than satisfying Christmas. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, it's, a, it's a really moving book. And, um, you know, again, like, I, I just enjoy seeing all those different perspectives. I think for me, it was, I mean, I identified very much with Elle or Ella that like I have to do everything and everything has to be up to everyone else's expectations otherwise I have failed the world um, 
But I think what I appreciated most about the book was, like, each character is convinced that their own misery cannot be understood by anyone else, and they have to deal with their own misery all by their lonesome. And it's, and you just, there, there comes a point where you just want to bang their heads together. <laughs> all three of you are all dealing with your own miseries, and you're all convinced that nobody else can understand them. <laughs> and they and all want to help each other. And they all want to but they all keep rejecting each other. Say what? Because no, I know nobody can understand me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> wow, we humans are a mess. <laughs> I think it was Chesterton. I was reading something from Chesterton that where he was saying like the one thing that all religions agree upon is that there is something wrong with people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think I've seen that. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's a very a, succinct a paraphrase. But yeah, you know what? This book's kind of, <laughs> but you know, like it just, it redeems it all at the end. Cause that's what Leslie does. That's what Leslie's work does. So yeah, I mean, I don't want to give away too much, but yeah. Christmas, I another also, like, and, and another thing too, is like, we have the family aspect in all of these. And I think anytime you deal with a holiday book, you can't help but deal with family because they're so closely intertwined, whether it's a problematic family or a happy family or whatever. But I think what I like about about Christmas Grace is like ultimately what happens in the end is that each member of the family gets closer, not just to their spouse, but to the whole family. The whole family is is closer and tighter by the end of the book. Yeah, that's that's right. And that's that shows the power. Like, okay, I'm sitting here like saying, you know expectations and how we you know go about them wrong so many times and all three of these char main characters in this book are doing that but how it's almost like that build up patience and as soon as they do clash it almost like breaks things open so that there can be oh that's what you wanted oh that's what you wanted here's how we can actually connect at last it's almost like a holiday opens up or can uh, open up this window of vulnerability that we don't avail ourselves of during your regular old mundane day yeah. does that make sense yeah, yeah well you know Sadly, holidays are like the only time a lot of families get together, you know, and so um, you bring people all together and, and that's sort of the rubbing against each other and, <laughs> and there you go. So I, I think holidays are perfect for that. Yeah, you hear so often about how like there's always a family blow up. And how often do you hear like there was a, a fa family healing during a holiday? Is that because they don't happen or is that because it's not conflict then we're not interested in learning from it yeah it's yeah. less dramatic it's less dramatic yeah. but the drama that le leads into it see that's where i think we people need more fiction in our lives because that's the place where you can get the conflict is this upside down no okay that's the place <laughs> where you can get the conflict and all the drama and then learn how it can fall together at the end. I'm not saying, like, I don't love, I, I love books that have satisfying endings. They don't have to have a happy ending. Right. It just ha so happens that in some way, every single one of these books has some kind of happy ending. And they're all to a certain degree really satisfying um, that we, in like our social media lives, we just kind of be, want to be like, oh, look, there's like 5 million comments on this one person's political rant. And there's, you know, 5 million angry faces on this person's meme or whatever. And there is no end of the story. So there's no happy ending on social media. Yeah. In fiction, you can get the whole shebang. And... I'm not, you know, trying to knock social media completely, although I'm trying to detox from it a little bit. But the something that fiction does that I don't think social media can is give you that resolution that we crave, that we are built to want. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. All right. Deep any other deep thoughts? <laughs> 
All right, guys. I, I think it's I have some Christmas. bad news. What's oh, no. That? I said, are we all ready for Christmas I now? Have some... <laughs> <laughs> um, no. <laughs> Looking forward to it, actually. But, like, this, the older I get, the more I'm, I'm becoming one of those, like, yay, Christmas is coming. I mean, I'm not Buddy the Elf or anything, but I'm, I'm not dreading it. Anyway, how about you, ladies? Are you looking forward to Christmas? Yeah. I'm looking forward to Christmas. I just, I'm a little just... overwhelmed if I think about, like, stuff, but... <laughs> No, actual Christmas, yeah. The expectations. <laughs> yeah, Set the expectations. expectations aside. Yeah. Or mind them for what their meaning is. How about you, yeah. Rebecca? Are you looking forward to Christmas? Um, yeah. I mean, I, I always look forward to Christmas. The last couple of years, it's my grandmother died two days before Christmas. So the season is, I'm still kind of recovering from the season being tied up with all the grieving. Yeah. So oh, yeah. It's good. each each Christmas brings a little bit more healing. So it's good. Yeah. Okay. Good. Well we'll we'll keep your it's the month of the holy souls for us papists. So we'll we'll keep your grandmom in prayer. Um Carolyn, we will I'll just say like one here's your last chance, guys, to comment. Anybody who's watching, <laughs> comment to win your copy of Christmas Grace. La la la. Um Anyway, so while we see if anybody does happen to comment, that's our bad news. I don't have anybody commenting for a copy of, of Christmas Grace, which is unfortunate because it's a really good book. Carolyn, did you want to um, make an announcement for anybody who um, watches this later to find out about yes. this month? Yes, Catholic Teen Books, the authors of Catholic Teen Books, of which there are like 12 or 13 of us, um, are having a pre-Christmas virtual Facebook party. And we're giving away gifts, including books, every 10 minutes, including a grand prize. And it's to help get teens and adults that have teens in their lives some ideas for Christmas gift giving, because fiction makes a wonderful Christmas gift. Um, so the easiest way to find the link is probably to go to catholicteenbooks.com. And you can find a link to the Facebook party. So it's, yeah, Friday, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, um, the 17th. And it'll be live on Facebook and lots and lots of prizes. That's great. And I like that it's um, so it's on a Friday night, so it's like a party. But if you are out, you can still access it from your app sure. on the phone. So yep. it's can, great. You can drop in and out. You don't have it's two hours long, but you don't have to be there for two hours. You can pop in. Like I said, the gifts are every prizes are every ten minutes. There's a new contest, so if you can pop in and pop out, that that works too. That's great. Mm -hmm. That sounds like a lot of fun. I'm gonna see if we can. Um, Pop in on it. I've got some teens in my house and they like to read. Yeah, there we go. All right. Thank you, everybody. This is our last Sabbath Rest Book Talk for 2017. We will see you again in February 2018. Please visit erinmccolecup.com for updates and um, the new schedule, the new reading list. We've got some exciting changes in format happening, as well as some really good. Um, coming up your way. I have to say the reason that we had to reschedule last week, well, there were several, but the funniest one has to do with one of our books that we're reading next year. Yeah, Re this is Rebecca's fault. <laughs> I blame you, Rebecca. So I have never read The You're Scarlet Pimpernel, and we're going to have that as one of our selections for next year. I forget which month, but I wanted to get ahead of it. So I got an audio book, and I was... Oh my goodness, I have not loved a book this much since I read Jane Eyre. So those of you who wow. know me know that that's, that's a lot. So I'm number one, I'm realizing, I think I'm like, I my, my taste is um, classical trash, basically, because it's such a, a melodramatic book and so swashbuckling. And I just love it, love it, love it, love it. I love the Scarlet Pimpernel. I was on the edge of my seat for like, most of the like all the book really and so i got this audio book and i pull it to the grocery store lot on sunday night last week and it's pouring down rain and i'm like okay i have 20 minutes left of this book i'm gonna put my earphones in and i'm gonna you know walk through the grocery store i listed the last 20 so okay so i leave my car in the pouring rain totally absorbed in this book an hour later i come out of the grocery store i have no idea where i parked <laughs> So I had to walk through. This is like a giant grocery store. It's not a giant brand, but it's a really big grocery store. I had to walk through the grocery store parking lot, pushing my cart in the pouring, drenching rain 
because of the Scarlet Pimpernel. <laughs> like, awesome. it was, I, I want to say it was like 20 minutes. It might have been longer that I'm walking through because I couldn't find my car. Oh my goodness, it was so embarrassing. But it was well worth it because now I really like the Scarlet I don't know how I started really listening to it. I mean, Percy Blakeney, come on. Love Percy. The funny thing is I hated him at the beginning. I'm like, oh my gosh. This, Cause that's like, since I, you know, received a oh, terrible oh. education, I, I had no idea. Yeah. I had no idea. Basically that I, I don't want to give anything away, but I had no idea what was going on. I'm like, oh, who is this? Who's this jerk <laughs> and jerky <laughs> wife? All right. These are going to be bad people. I just know it. And then they weren't. Yeah. Oh my goodness. So good. Well, we're really over time. But everybody, have, thank you for watching. The, uh, maybe, maybe we'll see if we can find some other way to give away a nice copy of um, Christmas Grace audiobook by Leslie Lynch, who's very generous enough to share share that with us this evening. Um, ladies, say goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> Bye. Bye. God bless everybody. Very tossed. Have a great night.